articulate to street corny gusty. His presence is forceful, militant, powerful, noble. His sense of humor can have the audience bouncing in their seats with laughter. Yet his ability to paint the seriousness and pain of the black experience in America can bring tears to the eyes of the toughest listeners. Scholars, historians, orators, activists. He has taught he has taught in the Pan-African Studies Department of California State University at Los Angeles, California State University at Long Beach, and has served as a scholar in the residence at, at Moorhead State University. He was a recipient of the Ford Foundation Fellowship to do intensive studies at Harvard, Yale, and Columbia. Armed with the Purple Heart and Valor Awards from the Civil Rights Movement and the Black Consciousness Movement in the 60s, he has traveled six times on fact, finding and research missions to Egypt, six times to Mecca in the Middle East, and three times to Jerusalem. He had first-hand experience. He has had his own, excuse me. He has had first-hand experience, has seen with his own eyes, and has lectured in every major city, town and township in South Africa on liberation. Because of his love and dedication to the liberation and salvation, the grassroots, the streets, the gangs, and the black masses in general. He is loved and honored for, for his strong, bold, uncompromising principle stand of the world all over. You can hear him on the world famous popular rap music, Public Enemies album. It takes a nation of millions to hold back, a, excuse me, I won't get this correct. It takes a nation of millions to hold us back. The rising rap star of Ice Cube of America's Most Wanted and promising work, and promising for white stars to make the movie Boys in the Hood to Dr. Khalid Muhammad. It has opened his eyes and told him what time it is. You can hear him on Cube's new album, Death Certificate. He is a member of the Honorable Marcus Garvey UNIA's African Communities League. The revolutionary scholar of national international recognition is a member of the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilizations and has, lect and has lectured on most of the American campuses in Nigeria, Egypt, Ghana, Liberia, South Africa, Uganda, Canada, England, France, and Italy. I would like to present to you Dr. Khalid, Khalid Mohammed. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, all praise is due to Allah, the Lord of all the world. I bear witness that regardless to land or label or language, there is but one God. And so in the name of that one God who came as it was written and prophesied that he would come to seek and to save that which was lost. And we can find no other people fitting the description of the Bible prophecies of the lost brother, the lost sister, or the lost sheep, except we, the 50 million or more, mentally and spiritually dead, black men and women here in the hells of North America. And so we thank him for coming and raising up his Messiah and his messenger the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, and we thank the two of them for the man who we believe is the champion for the liberation and salvation of the black nation, that man who we believe is anointed and appointed for this hour of our resurrection and rise. I speak of none other than the honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, and so in the name of Master Farad Muhammad, the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, I greet you, my beloved and beautiful black sisters and brothers and others, with the greeting words of peace. Assalamu alaikum. Hotel. Alafia. Free the land and black laws for all black people. It is indeed my honor to be invited here on the King College campus 
and to speak to you on this very important topic entitled, I did not choose it myself, but I welcome the opportunity to speak on this topic. The topic that has been given to me is the secret relationship between blacks and Jews. Now let's not get it confused. Let's act like we know. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> the subject, the secret relationship between blacks and Jews. I bring you greetings here at King College in Jersey from the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan who sends his greetings of love and unity and solidarity. And with us this evening is his representative from our mosque in Newark, New Jersey, but also over the entire state of New Jersey, his representative and his minister, Minister Kadir Muhammad. Please, let us give him a black hand. Why is it called the secret relationship between blacks and Jews? First of all, there are a group of faculty and staff and some Jewish students, I believe, and others from the community who are passing out this wonderful note. I think we should go over this note and let this note help us to set the tone for the evening. Is that all right? Let me say to you before we even get started. If your seats get too hot for you, don't leave. Just raise up and fan it a little bit and sit back down. Everything will be all right. And to the whites who are in the audience, let me say to you before we even get started, it's going to be a rough ride, buddy. <laughs> it's going to be a rough ride. You better buckle in. Buckle up, guy. Buckle your seatbelt. If for any reason this auditorium becomes depressurized. Automatically, oxygen masks will fall from the ceiling. Please make sure to fix the, fix the elastic band around your head firmly and put the mask over your mouth and nose first and then help the white person next to you. <laughs> I didn't come to Keene College to tiptoe through the tulips. I didn't come to King College to pussyfoot. I didn't come to King College to dilly-dally and uh, beat around the bush. I didn't come to pin the tail on the donkey. I came to pin the tail on the hunky. <laughs> I came to speak the truth, whether you like that truth or not. I couldn't give a damn if you stood thousands on the sidewalk passing out leaflets before my people come in here this evening. We have a right to evaluate and examine the secret relationship between blacks and Jews. Good evening. This is the truth hour. And don't you touch that dial. <laughs> you stay tuned in. Let us read November 29, 1993. A note from the Keene College Jewish Faculty and Staff Association. Shall we? To those attending the secret relationship between blacks and Jews, we affirm the speaker's constitutional right to offer controversial views. But we only ask that this audience use the same critical thinking and evaluation that would normally be expected in a college community. Without prejudging the content of this lecture, the book of the same title by anonymous authors, the Historical Research Department in parentheses of the Nation of Islam, has drawn the repudiation of African Americans like, let's see what this honor roll is here. African Americans like Clarence Page, William Raspberry, Stanley Couch, Alice Walker, Ishmael Reed, August Wilson, Mel Reynolds, John Lewis, 
Uncle Tom, uh, Tom Bradley, a stinking David Dickens, Ron Brown, and the late Bayard Rustin. <laughs> Y'all know Bayard, honey. One of Shanae's friends. <laughs> Bayard Rustin debated Malcolm X, El Hajj Malik El Shabazz, Brother Overwallet. Brother Malcolm debated on the Ivy League campuses of white America with an eighth grade education from the white man, but supreme wisdom from the old, from Almighty God, man in our midst with that old time knowledge and ancient wisdom from the very beginning, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And Malcolm was able to handcuff scholars all over America. Some crackers, that's what I told you. Some crackers with one PhD. Some with two PhDs. But when white folks can't defeat you, they'll always find some Negro, some boot-licking, butt-licking, buck-dancing, bamboozled, half-baked, half-fried, sissified, pokified, pasteurized, homogenized nigga that they can trot out in front of you. I hear you had one of these Negroes on campus a few weeks ago, some Negro named Louis Gates. Who let this Negro out of the gate? <laughs> Henry Louis Gates. Malcolm debated Bayard Rustin for the white folks. Bayard took the position on the peck of wood, and Malcolm beat the hell out of him. And when Malcolm got through beating him, Malcolm said, if it's one thing I hate, is a white man who acts like a white, that is a black man who acts like a white man. Malcolm said, if it's one thing I hate worse, that a black man who acts like a white man is a black man who acts like a white woman. And Malcolm smoked it in that debate. Let us go. This esteemed, these esteemed ones from among us, Jesse Jackson, Keep hope alive. I am a somebody. I am a somebody. I don't rightly know who the hell I am. But I am a somebody. Keep hope alive. As well as scholars such, if I've mentioned Gates, Cornell West, Orlando Patterson, and Selwyn Kutcho, give me a break. <laughs> These critics generally have found this book to over rely on isolated information out of context, anecdotes without a historical or demographic perspective, and paltry figures without comparisons. For example, the names, gee whiz of 11 Jewish Confederate Navy officers arrested. But how large was the Confederate Navy? Hell, we don't learn that. The biggest historical controversy rests on Jewish commercial involvement in the slave trade. This book claims that Jews were the main beneficiaries of the slave economy, but the established historical record finds only about 2% Jewish involvement. Don't misunderstand, guys. Our position, that was 2% too many. Still probably, all the Jewish slave traders combined did not buy and sell as many slaves as did the firm of Franklin and Armfield, the largest Negro traders in the South. Furthermore, the secret relationship has explicitly drawn on the rhetoric of white supremacists whose hatred for Jews is matched only by their contempt for blacks. The stereotypes of both minorities have a haunting similarity. The truth is that all of the European powers were involved in the slave trade and it was supported by nearly all white Americans. North, uh, including Protestants and Catholics, labor and business, North and South and slavery in North America predated the first Jewish immigration by over 30 years. Moreover, a broader historical context finds only a minor role of Jews in the slave trade, but a profound role of Jews 
in the struggle for civil rights. Some even gave their lives. And many saw the inside of southern jails. The record of working together for social justice is much more, much broader than the negative incidents of this book's focus. The whole record should not be forgotten. I wanted you to go over this with me, and now I want to attack the hell out of it. Let's look at it. They referred to our book from the Historical Research Department of the Nation of Islam, called, entitled, the secret relationship between blacks and Jews. Here they say that it is by anonymous authors called the Historical Research Department. Well, my brothers and sisters, this book was not written by anonymous authors. This book is written by all Jewish scholars, all Jewish respected writers, scholars, publishing houses, clergy. That is what you will find in this book. We have compiled from research from among all Jews what Jews have to say about who? About Jews. The book, as we open it, as we dare to open it, on the King College campus, the information contained herein has been compiled primarily from Jewish historical literature. Every effort has been made to present evidence from the most respected of Jewish authorities. From the most respected of what? Jewish Talk back to me. Talk black to me. Don't be scared because Kathy's here. <laughs> Susie, Heather, Cindy, Bob, Bill, Larry. The hell with Heather. <laughs> Present evidence is from the most respected Jewish what? What kind of authority? Jewish authority. Whose works appear in established historical journals are published by authoritative Jewish publishing houses. Now let's get started. Throughout the history of the practice, Jews and the African slave trade, Jews have been involved in the purchase and sale of human beings. This fact is confirmed by their own scholars and historians. Whose scholars and historians? In his book, A History of the Jews, Solomon Krasel, a Jew, states that Jews, quote, were among the most important slave dealers. What did he say? They were among the most important what? In European society. Lady Magnus writes that in the Middle Ages, quote, the principal purchasers, purchasers of slaves were found among the Jews. They seemed to be always and everywhere at hand to buy and to have the means equally ready to pay. Henry L. Feingold, and they're always looking for gold, stated that Jews who were frequently found at the heart of commerce could not have failed to contribute a proportionate share to the slave trade directly or indirectly. Solomon Grazel, A History of the Jew from Babylonian Exile to the End of World War II, Philadelphia, Jewish Publication Society of America, page 312. Lady Magnus, Outlines of Jewish History, and it goes on to tell you the different, different pub Jewish publishing houses that published it, but it also tells you that it can be found in the Jewish Encyclopedia of New York and London, and it goes on to tell you which uh, edition, what page, what volume. Brothers and sisters, the so-called Jew, and I must say so-called Jew, because 
You're not the true Jew. You are a Johnny come lately Jew who just crawled out of the caves and hills of Europe just a little over 4,000 years ago. You are not from the original people. You are a European strain of people who crawled around on your all fours in the caves and hills of Europe eating juniper roots and eating each other. You knew nothing about fire. You knew nothing about funerary science or nothing about embalming. You left your dead right in the cave with you and you slept with your dead for 2,000 years smelling the stench coming up from the decomposing body. You knew nothing about bathrooms and toilets and restrooms and sanitation systems. You did your number one and your number two, your PP and your two, two, which should be a don't, don't, right in the caves and hills of Europe. You slept in your urination and your defecation generation after generation for 2,000 years. You knew nothing about fire. You knocked your animals in the head with clubs and boulders and bricks or whatever you had at that time. You made a chisel or found already that way and drug them back to the cave, dragged them back to the cave and all of you would just gum them and eat the fur, the dirt, the filth and suck the blood from the raw meat. And you still eat your meat raw to this very day. While you live like this, this black man and black woman that you in a condescending way look down your nose at on the Keene College campus. You're looking at the sons and daughters of your very mothers and fathers to the whites who are in this audience. Why you wouldn't even be here if it were not for the original black man and the original black woman. We are your mother and we are your father. Not only are we your mother and father biologically and genetically and historically, but we are the father and mother of all of the disciplines, all of the sciences, everything that you have built your so-called civilization on. Why is it a secret relationship? It's a secret relationship because you have lied to us all this time. You have lied to us. Now, one man born from Sandersville, Georgia, a little black man named the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad, raised up by God in the midst of the black people of the world, but in particular in the midst of the black man and woman here in the hells of the United States of America. One Elijah Muhammad, God's man, his messenger, his Messiah in our midst, and now he is shaped and anointed and appointed by God's command and commission. One Honorable Louis Farrakhan, whose mission now is to open our eyes, to wake us up, and to teach us the truth after we've been lied to for so long. The so-called Jew, let me cover that before I get too far. Let's go to the Bible. Is it all right? Some of you have put this book down. But the Bible is a road map to our liberation and salvation if properly understood. From Genesis to Revelation, the Bible actually has our history. We are living in the Bible right now, brothers and sisters. We are walking on the pages of Scripture. The late night news, the early evening news, the headlines of the newspapers and magazines can be found right in this Bible. But you must go in the Bible with a proper understanding. Otherwise, you go in a fool and come out an even bigger fool. The Bible is written in parables and symbols and metaphors and similes. And someone must uncover the parable, the symbol, the metaphor of the simile so that we must understand the pitfalls and the snares that the white man has added to the book. Everybody got a virgin, Schofield virgin, some cracker named Schofield, Dewey virgin, another Peckerwood named Dewey, King James virgin, here's a sister. Can you name a virgin of the Bible after a screaming sister? 
the shenanay of his day. <laughs> the wonder of his day. God does not name holy books after homosexual. Khalid Muhammad came on our campus and insulted the Jews and the whites and the homosexuals. Don't you all go in the same group together? <laughs> I didn't come here to take no prison. I didn't come to take no prison. And if you wouldn't have been so silly standing out on the sidewalk, passing out flyers, calling yourself with this passive-aggressive punk protest, I probably wouldn't even mention you that much. But the students chose this subject because they're catching so much hell here under you on the Keene College campus and in the surrounding union area, a Jew stronghold. But you're weak tonight. You won't come in and face me on the book. You stand on the sidewalk like a sissy. You hide in the dark like a punk. But you won't come in and face me on the book. I went out personally and invited you to come in. And you shook in your shoes and peed in your boots. <laughs> you want to lie. And say whatever you want to say. You've heard a lot about me, but you haven't heard from me. But I'm here, bam, bam, in your face. Straight up. Straight up. Let's look at the Bible here for a minute. See what we can come up with. Let's go to for a second. Let's go to the book of John. Is that all right? John, the eighth chapter, starting with the thirty-first verse. All right. Then said Jesus, "Who's talking? Who's talking? Let me stop right now." When I say Jesus up here, I'm not talking about no blonde hair, blue eyed, pale skin, buttermilk complexion, pepperwood cracker Christ. When I say Jesus up here, I'm talking about the Jesus that the Bible says his body would be like Jasper. Another scripture says his body would be like fur. Another scripture says his body would be like fine brass, as though it had been burnt in an oven. It says he would have hair like lamb's wood. I'm talking about that nasty hat. I'm talking about that good hat. Before you fried it and died and it laid it to the side. Before you got your scary curve. Before you got your temporary permanent. Before you got your blonde wig running around King College. Talking about blondes have more fun. And you're not having no more fun. The Bible said Jesus would have nappy hair. So where did these pictures come from with this stringy-haired, straight-haired, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, pale-skinned, buttermilk complexion, pepperwood cheese? It's the white man. The white man's got a God complex. Pope Julius II, who commissioned Michael Angelo. And I ain't talking about no teenage mutant ninja turtle. <laughs> For Julius II commissioned Michelangelo to change Jesus from black to white. His hair from nappy and kinky to straight, weak, and straight. And so now we have a white Jesus. But the Bible says, I beheld until the thrones were cast down. Right. And the Ancient of Days did sit. And it goes on to tell you that he would have hair like lamb's wool and his body would be like fine grass, burnt in and up. There are white people throughout different sections of Europe to this very day who make their prayers in front of a black man yes, and a black chief. Go to the Vatican and roll. With no, no good pope. You know that cracker. Somebody need to raise that dress up and see what's really under there. <laughs> <laughs> when 
when the old Pope was shot. He didn't pray in front of no white Mary. Life magazine, one of the big magazines, showed him kneeling down making his prayers in front of a black Mary and a black baby Jesus. And he wasn't in no hurry to get checked out of here either. Talking about he's the vicar of Christ, the right hand of God. That he's going instantly to heaven, to paradise. Well, how come when they shot that cracker, he didn't say, no, 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 get away from me. They called in the best doctors they could get. Because he wasn't anxious to go anywhere. Let's look at it. You with me? Yes. Let's look at it for a moment. Look at it. Brothers and sisters, as I move beyond that point back to John, the 8th chapter, the 31st verse. Then said Jesus to those Jews who believed of him. He said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The Jews answered Jesus and said, how sayest thou that we shall be made free? We have never been in bondage to any man. Jesus goes on to say to them, they said to him, we be Abraham's seed. And we have never been in bondage to any man. Jesus answered the Jews and said, verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abided not in the house forever, but the son abided forever. And if the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's seed, because Abraham is called the father of the nation. But you seek to kill me. Who is Jesus talking to? He said, you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. Jesus said his word had no place in the Jew. Was that Elijah Muhammad who said that? Was it Louis Farrakhan who said that? Was it the little student of theirs, Khalid or Kadir, who said that? No, it says Jesus said, my word has no place in you. He goes on to say, I speak that which I have seen with my father, and you do that which you have seen with your father. So Jesus started playing a dozen with him. He started talking about their dad. He said, yo, we got different daddies. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said unto them, if. What did he say? What did he say? What did he say? If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But you seek to kill me, Jew, a man that has told you the truth, which I have heard of God, this Abraham would not do. You do the deeds of your father. Then the Jews said to Jesus, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. You know how they quick to say that. One people one planet. Hell, you didn't want to share it with us until it got all out of whack. Until you had messed up the ozone layer. Until you had destroyed much of the rainforest. Until you had tampered with the delicate balance in nature. Polluted the very air that even you have to breathe. Polluted the very water that even you have to drink. You didn't want one planet, one people, until you had messed it up. And now you see your demise. And you see our rise. And so now we're one people. Multiculturalism, buddy. <laughs> we need a divine, a design for diversity. Give me a break to go and hold on. <laughs> but you seek to kill me, a man that has told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This Abraham would not do. You do the deeds of your father. And they went on to say, We be not born of fornication, we have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God. What did he say? If what did he say? If, if God were your father, you would love me. Now that preposition is a strong prep preposition. If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech, Jew? 
even because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father the devil. What did Jesus say? <laughs> you are of your father the devil. And the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. And a bold not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he's a liar and the father of the lie. Jesus started playing a dozen with the devil. Told the Jew, the so-called Jew, you are of your father, the devil. And the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. He abode not in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he's a liar and the father of the lie. Now, Jesus, clearly, John the 8th chapter, beginning with the 31st verse, going down to the 44th verse, tells us that these people are of the what? Yeah. Of the devil. Let's go to the book of Revelation. Is it alright? Yeah. Let's go to the book of Revelation. I sure wish those esteemed professors would come in out of the cold and take this whipping in person. <laughs> I got something for you, Professor. <laughs> professor Goldberg. <laughs> An old thing. Hiding out there. My leader sought dialogue with you. My leader did everything to show that he is a man of character, a man of principle, a man of God. My leader extended to you the torch light. To shine the light for you. But you like the way of all of the ancient wicked rulers. And slave makers and slave masters. You cannot accept truth coming from one of the lowly slaves. From in your midst. And so though he shines a light. A torch light in America. It is a torch light for that people that the Bible says us. That people who have walked in dark. But who would see a bright light arise and shine for that light is coming. So it shines a torch light for us, but it is a torch light for America also. If you would adhere to what he is saying to God's warning through his messenger and through his divine warning in your midst, then maybe you could have an extension of time. But because you like ancient Pharaoh symbolically in scripture, your heart is hot. And you cannot hear the warning of the warner in your midst. Revelation 3 and 9. Revelation what? Three. Write these scriptures down. We also had John, the 8th chapter. Starting with the 31st verse, going, going, going on down to the 44th verse. Well, now we go to John, no, to Revelation by John the Revelator, when Jesus is in here too. 3 and 9, you ready? Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan. What does it say? I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not Jews. What does it say? Behold. Don't get hung up on behold. All it means is, look at here, yo. <laughs> the writer is saying, yo. I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, but are not Jews, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship and bow down at your feet and to know that I have loved you. Revelation 3 and 9 speaks of a people who would call themselves Jews, but who are not Jews, but who are of according to Revelation, not Elijah Muhammad, not Louis Farrakhan, not Kadir, not Khalid, but according to Revelations, they do lie, they are not Jews, but they are imposter Jews, and according to Revelation, they are the synagogue of Satan the devil. That's according to the book. Don't slay it. 
what I'm going to do if the book slay. And then Jesus just got through slaying the these guys. Daddy was the devil. Jesus stopped pulling limbs off the family tree. <laughs> this thing is serious. No wonder they hate Jesus. No wonder they don't believe in Jesus. No wonder they crucified Jesus. It was the Jews who crucified Jesus, the so-called Jews of his day. They contended with Jesus on a daily basis, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and later a special group called the Sanhedrin. The scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and a group called the Sanhedrin. I wish you had your rabbis in here. I wish you had your professors in here. I wish you had some of the best minds among the so-called Jewish people in the city of Union and from the campus of King County. What cowards you are. This is supposed to be an institution of academics. This is supposed to be an institution where you don't mind the students being exposed to various schools of thought. The professors should be in here right now. If I'm lying, they should be challenging me on everything. We will have a question and answer period at the close of this lecture. And you'll be able to stand up, God. You'll be able to stand up, buddy. Anything you want to say, you'll be welcome. Just say it. All right? Or out. <laughs> No, that's from Scripture. These people are not the chosen people of God. They say that we are anti-Semites. How arrogant you are. No good, bastard. <laughs> bastard is an illegitimate child of the Father. You call us anti-Semites? How arrogant are you? There are some Semites in Africa. They're Semites, the Arabs. Are you trying to make the world think that you're the only Semites in the world? You're anti-Semitic. Look at what you're doing to the Arab people, to the Palestinian people. You have dispossessed them, disinherited them. They're now disenfranchised. Disheartened, just dissed. <laughs> By you. You've driven them like vagabonds from their home. They are Semitic people. And you are anti-Semitic. The true name for Egypt is Kemet. What is the true name for Egypt? Kemet. But the Greek, the freak, gave it the name Egypt. The root etymologically of Egypt coming out of the Greek is Aeptus means the land of the black and the burnt skin people. So don't you give me no Cleopatra queen and get Elizabeth Taylor some whore from Hollywood <laughs> screwing everything that ain't screwed up. <laughs> Elizabeth Taylor is nothing but a white whore from Hollywood. I say she screws everything that ain't screwed down. You gonna get this white whore? disgrace us, insult us before the world, and portray an African queen in the image of, Cleo, of Cleopatra using this woman, Elizabeth Taylor. What a shame, what a lie Jesus was right. Nothing but lie. The book of Revelation is right. You're from the synagogue of Satan. You didn't want to deal with my leader in a respect Way. You disrespected my leader. So now God unleashes on you his wrath and his judgment because you want an ear to the torch light that is shining in your midst. And I'm one of his flame throwers. And I came in a curve your behind. Say I'm anti-Semitic. If you are Semite, I'm goddamn it, whatever. I'm against whatever you are. <laughs> whatever 
you are, man. <laughs> I'm saying, and I feel like that's kosher, buddy. <laughs> you didn't want to talk to Louis Farrakhan. You disrespected him. And then you lied on him in the media to try to make black people believe that he had compromised, that he had capitulated. Every wise leader has to meet with the enemy. That's not compromise. That's not capitulation. Even Jesus met with the devil. They went up on a mountain. Even God met with the devil. They talked about Job, the servant of God. Now the scriptures say the sons of God came together, but Satan was also there among them. Huh? Elijah in the Bible met with the wicked king Ahab. Moses and Aaron, under that symbolic prophecy in scripture, met with Pharaoh. Why do I keep saying symbolic? Because ain't no white Jews ever been in bondage for no 400 years in black Egypt. No. You just a damn lie. You've never been in bondage in Egypt for 400 years. That's why they call us Kemetic. That's why they call us the Kemite. That's why you named us Egyptians. Black, birth skin. We are dominant, strong. You are recessive, weak. If you spent 400 years among us, we wouldn't even be able to recognize you now. We would have swallowed you up and annihilated you. That's your fear, as Dr. Wellston says, of genetic annihilation. That's you who came with the keys to the colors, buddy. You weren't in bondage in Egypt for 400 years. I've been to Kemet. I've been to so-called Egypt seven times. Dr. Yusuf bin Yaqin, Dr. John Henry Clark, two of our grand master historians and esteemed and venerable elders and masters of history have been countless times. Dr. Maulana Karek, Dr. Ivan Van Serta, Dr. Sheikh Anta Diop. Huh? One of the upcoming great historians, uh, among us, Brother Anthony Browder, many of the greats, Professor James Small, Dr. Leonard Jeffrey, Dr. Rosalind Jeffrey, huh? Dr. Nathan Hare, Dr. Julia Hare, Professor and Dr. Asa Hilliard out of Atlanta, Dr. Jake Carruthers, they've all been. We've been in every library. We've been in every museum. We've been in the temple. We've been in the tombs. We can't find any record of any white Jews ever been in, having been in bondage in Egypt for 400 years. Do you remember when Walter Cronkite was sitting at the base of the pyramids with Anwar Sadat and Mr. Cronkite with that golden cracker voice of his? Mr. Cronkite said, isn't it? Wonderful, Mr. Sadat. Here we are, sitting at the base of the pyramids, built by Mr. Pagan's people. Anwar Sadat said, I beg your pardon. He said, we have no history of that. How can you lie? It says that Abraham, you say, is the original Jew. But Abraham was a black man. He came from Ur of Chaldea. But when Abraham arrived with the so-called first group that you try to rest on, we'll let you rest on that for a second. When Abraham arrived, we had built the pyramids already. We had already sculpted the Sphinx. Hundreds of years had passed. Some scholars say even thousands of years. You didn't build nothing, buddy. If you built the pyramids, why can't we go somewhere else, guy, and find such greatness among you? All your stuff is crumbled and fallen to the ground. <laughs> pyramids called one of the wonders of the world. Planet Earth 196,940,000 square miles. 
57,255,000 square miles of land coming up out of 139,685,000 square miles of water, so teaches the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and the honorable Mr. Louis Farrakhan. But that ancient black man, that ancient black woman, our forefathers and foremothers, our heroes and sheroes, if you study the history and the history from the balances of our brain and with the span of our head, we were able to determine geographically the center and build the pyramids and the white man calls the pyramids one of the wonders of the world, which means in spite of the Empire State Building, in spite of the Sears Tower, in spite of all the Westminster Abbey, in spite of all of his great architectural buildings, he calls the pyramids one of the wonders of the world which means, buddy, that this cracker is still wondering how we were able to do it. Have them figured it out yet? No white Jews ever in bondage in Egypt for 400 years. You are not the chosen people of God. Stop telling that lie. Let's go a little further with this. The secret relationship. Many of you put out the textbooks. Many of you control the library. Live. Prairie. <laughs> NBC. ABC. CBS. You don't see nothing. Make sure we don't see. Warner Brothers. Paramount. Huh? Hollywood, period. Some of your own Jewish historians have written books on the inordinate influence of the so-called Jews in Hollywood. Some of your own Jewish writers have written. You put these negative stereotypes out on black people. We always clowns on TV. I love Martin. <laughs> but I'm tired of us being fools for white folks. Right. Only way we can get on is to be cut the fools for the white man, and we always got to be a sissy before it's over. That's right. We got to dress up in drag so the white man can laugh at us. Right. Men's in fear. <laughs> in living color. Look at it, brothers and sisters. Dr. Jeffries was right. 100% right. When he talked about your influence in television, in radio, I'm adding that, but in the movie industry, in particular in Hollywood, but you also are most influential in newspaper, magazine, print media, and electronic media. If I'm lying on you, come forward. If I'm lying on you, let's have another forum when you've had a chance to go over my words, and I'll meet with your best so-called Jew minds. Bring me ten of your best. And I'll come with my God in my person. I don't believe in no fire in the sky in the sweet by and by after I die. I believe in some sound on the ground while I'm still alive. <laughs> no mystery. No doubt. Shazam. Abracadabra. No hocus pocus. God is real in the person of the black man and woman of age. Another subject for another time. Africa. Go deal with it. I'm almost there, but I gotta work this subject. This ain't nothing to play with here. Anyway, where you gonna go in you? <laughs> the secret relationship between blacks Stimulate thought. If you'll jump up and go back, you'll, some of you will take me back to all of these points, I hope. Look at it, brothers and sisters, for what it's worth. These people have had a secret relationship with us. They have our entertainers in their hip pocket, in the palm of their hand, I should say. They have our athletes in the palm of their hand. If you are an athlete, a star athlete, it is required of you that you be apolitical. 
You can't be black. You can't stand up for your people. You must be apolitical. And normally they will give you a white woman. All of them, with the exception of just a few of the big names, got a white woman. Susie. Kathy. Cindy. Dana. Heather. It's true. Very few of them. Amy. <laughs> they have them in the palm of their hand. Many of our politicians are in the palm of the white man's hand, but in particular in the palm of the Jewish white man's hand. When stinking David Dinkins ran for mayor when he ran the first time. He would come on television with his yarmulke on. Nigga didn't wear no African boobum on. He didn't wear his African clothes. He didn't wear a kente crown. He didn't wear a red, black, and green crown. He didn't wear a butt cloth crown. He wore a yarmulke on his head. Boot licking for the so-called Jew. He said, ah! Ah, <laughs> 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 <I>, David Stinkins. <laughs>
good brothers and sisters. We have Brother Sundi out of here, and I saw Sister Shandala, who helped me do some of the research on King James. And they have the wonderful selection of liberation literature. Hold your hand up, Brother Sundi out of here. I don't see Sister Shandala. Or Shandala. They are set up on the outside with liberation literature. Give them a better hand than that. But K. Edgar Hoover set up a spying program to discredit black leadership and destroy black organizations. Study the FBI files made available through the Freedom of Information Act, where they said we must stop the rise of a black messiah who could unify and electrify the masses of black people. We must lie on them in word, discredit them, misdirect them. We must neutralize their organizations and destroy them. And so they put this propaganda out against the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. The secret relationship between blacks and Jews. Well, there ain't going to be too many left in a few minutes. <laughs> My guy. <laughs> the truth is like rain. I mean, when rain walks in the room, I mean... The Jews have told us, the so-called Jews have told us, the, the, the suffer like you, the, 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 the march with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the, the, the were in Selma, Alabama, the, the were in Montgomery, Alabama, the, the, were on the front lines of the civil rights marches. We have always supported you. But let's take a look at it. The Jews, the so-called Jews, what they have actually done, brothers and sisters, is used us as cannon fodder. They wanted to get certain laws struck from the books. And so they put us out front as the cannon fodder. And they found it Negro organizations. I didn't say black organizations. They founded Negro organizations. Let's look at it. You ready? The NAACP was founded by the white Jew. For much of this century, Jews have been a prominent element in the liberal wing of white North America. According to Kaufman, we want to deal with Kaufman. This is from another Jewish writer. From who? A Jewish writer, Jonathan Kaufman, in his book, Broken Alliance. Broke, I want to use white Jew references. Is that okay? Okay. Jonathan Kaufman, in Broken Alliance, admits that the Jews who first came to America in the 17th, 18th, and early 19th centuries were heirs to a conservative political tradition that tended to embrace the status quo. Slavery, of course, was a major part of that status quo. For much of this century, Jews have been a prominent element in the liberal wing of white North America. According to Kaufman, in his book, Broken Alliance, this switch to seeming liberalism very different from the slavery and earlier post-slavery era, was facilitated by the development of the reform movement in U.S. Judaism in the late 19th century by Jewish involvement in communism and socialism by the pursuit of an enlightened Jewish self-interest. The pursuit of an enlightened Jewish self-interest. Meaning, whatever they did, they did it for themselves first, and they used us so that we could clear a path for them. Let us go on. In the words of Kaufman, the Jewish, quote, struggle for equality and fair treatment was linked to the struggles of blacks for greater opportunity. It was not a struggle of equals, Jonathan Kaufman, the white Jew, said. Jews did not consider their plight equal to that of blacks but they recognized in the black struggle for rights 
elements that could benefit them and conditions with which they could sympathize. Accordingly, several rich and powerful Jews among them, prominent leaders of the U.S. Zionist movement, co-founded, led, and financed the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. The NAACP, founded in 1909, got its first African-American chairperson in 1975. It was in 1975 before you had a black chairperson of the NAACP, and it was founded in 1909. Did you hear me? After the death of Chairman Kiva Kaplan, a Boston Jew, the NAACP is highest honor, the Spingarn Medal, is named after one of its earlier Jewish leaders, Joel Spingarn. Jewish influence in African-American affairs climaxed in the civil rights era of the 1950s to 1960s, when according to Jonathan Kaufman, the white Jew in Broken Alliance, three quarters of the funding raised, how much? Three quarters of the funding raised by the three major civil rights organizations, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, the Congress of Racial Equality, CORE, and Martin Luther King Jr.'s SCLC, Southern Christian Southern Christian Leadership Conference came from Jewish sources. Jewish influence in the movement was personalized and personified by Stanley Levinson, one of King's two closest advisors, the other being Andrew Young. Levinson drafted King's speeches, handled his, handled his finances, and served as his chief strategist. This coalition of unequals came under stress, severe stress, after the mid-1960s when black power came to town, emphasizing self-reliance and African-American control over their organization. Much of this comes to us from black news, uh, uh, blacks and Jews news, and uh, Dr. Tony Martin has done much of this research for us. But we're drawing here from Mr. Jonathan Kaufman of Broken Alliance. Brothers and sisters, these African-American assertions of independence did not sit well with Jews who had grown accustomed to overlordship of the civil rights movement, not to mention great influence in the economic life of African-American communities. While pockets of Jewish liberalism remained, the dominant Jewish posture was now characterized by the demise of benevolent paternalism and its replacement by an aggressive hostility to continuing African-American progress. The new policy brought some impressive Jewish victories as Jews leveraged, leveraged off of their great influence with the United States polity to thwart the rising ambitions of black folk. In 1968, Jews defeated the efforts of blacks in America in Brooklyn, New York to control the education of their own children in the Ocean Hill Brownsville affair. In 1977, the major Jewish organizations intruded themselves as quote unquote friends of the court in the Baki case to defeat affirmative action programs for black people, Hispanics, Asian Americans, and Native Americans. When Mandela came, the Jews jumped right on Mandela, and Mandela had to explain to the Jews, especially when old Hook knows me, Ted Capo had him on. Mandela had to explain, quote, your enemies, meaning Yasser Arafat and the Palestinian Liberation Organization, are not my enemies. They always tell us, we suffered like you. We, down south, one of us was killed right along with your civil rights workers down there. Please, give me a break with this. As it says here from Broken Alliance, from the Jewish writer himself, who talks with them, who eats bagels with them, locks with them, who goes to the synagogue with them, who plays golf with them, who sits with them out and out of and beyond our earshot, that they had a self-interest that they were doing these things to use us as cannon fodder to get these laws cleared from the books and as soon as they were cleared, to whatever degree, then they started moving against us and attacking us 
and taking the opposite position every time an issue came up that was in our best interest. And they pulled their money, for the most part, out of the civil rights organizations when the civil rights organizations started standing up to them. This is the case, brothers and sisters. Who are the slum lords in the black community? The so-called Jews. Run down dilapidated buildings. Huh? Water not working properly. Toilets not working properly. The plumbing is terrible. The heating is terrible. Big rats and roaches. Playing hopscotch all in the hall. <laughs> Mosquitoes carry ice pits. <laughs> when I'm stinging you, you're in serious trouble. The white slum lord, the white so-called Jew slum lords and the other white slum lords. Who is it sucking our blood in the black community? A white imposter Arab and a white imposter Jew right in the black community sucking our blood on a daily and consistent basis. They sell us pork and they don't even eat it themselves. A meat cake full of rotten pork meat and the imposter Arab and the imposter white Jew, neither of them eat it themselves. A wall full of liquor, keeping our people drunk and out of their heads and filled with the swill of the swine, affecting their minds. They're the blood suckers of the black nation and the black community. Professor Griff was right when he spoke here. Then he spoke at, when he spoke in the general vicinity of Jersey and New York. And when he spoke at Columbia University over in New York City. <laughs> he was right. The comments that Professor Griff made and if you scared of Professor Griff, I'm Professor Griff's professor. <laughs> you know you're in trouble. He was 100% right. Brother Steve Coakley, 100% right. Brothers and sisters, everyone that they've attacked, Dr. Jeffries. Yes, sir. I just mentioned uh, Dr. Tony Martin. All of them have told us the truth. Dr. Yusuf Ben Yakima. Now they're attacking Dr. Malefi Asante. They're attacking Afrocentricity. They're saying that our position now, the research that we're doing, they just summarily dismiss it, but none of them want to debate. Bring me your best. I'm calling you out. Bring me your best white historians, your best Jewish scholars. Bring them. And I'm just a student of a student of a student of a student. So you know if I can throw down like this, you know the teacher must really be bad. You know you don't want to face the teacher. The secret relationship between blacks and Jews. The secret is they have lied to us. Now they tell us that they didn't play much of a role in the slave trade. Is that what they said in this little letter that they handed out? Jews were masters in high percentages, says U.S. Census. U.S. what? <laughs> According to the U.S. Census of 1830, a majority of Southern Jews owned black slaves. What? How many? A majority. Ira Rosenweig, a white Jew, a respected Jewish authority, who has published Jewish population studies has revealed that as many as 75% of Southern Jewish households held black men, women, and children as slaves. Who said it? Elijah Muhammad? No, Louis Farrakhan? No, Kadir? No, Khaled? No. no, a respected Jewish authority who has published Jewish population studies has revealed that as many as 75% of Southern Jewish households held black men, women, and children as slaves. Even more striking, in 1890, when slavery was abolished, two-thirds of all the Jewish families in the United States had slaves. Did you hear what I said? No good lying bastard sit around here and lie, but you won't come in and face me. 
because you know I've got off. I didn't bring all my stuff out here. Brother, when a couple of brothers just bring everything I had there, I had so much stuff, I thought it was going to be a bunch of white folks. I just came with all my, came with my chew, wall chips. <laughs> I couldn't get a cracker to come in here and do nothing. You outside pooping in the wind. <laughs> so much stuff I didn't take a couple. I had all my stuff. Got some more in the truck of the car. I thought there would be Jews everywhere. Ready to do battle to them. They just come. Got to greet the other We got to greet the other one. Thank you. Let's put up here. I got to work for this thing. What about the unholy alliance? Dr. John Henry Clark called it the unholy alliance between Israel and South Africa. He calls it scratches on a time bomb. The unholy alliance between Israel and South Africa. Let's look at it. Oh yeah, I mean that ain't no clothes, this ain't no socks. <laughs> Let's look at it. 
Israel's voting record in the United Nations where South Africa and anti-apartheid resolutions have come on the floor. When an anti-racist, anti-apartheid resolution has come on the floor of the United Nations, this is the way Israel has voted. The so-called Jews. Resolution 3055. Israel, obviously and apparently absent. Resolution 3151A. Israel, obviously and apparently absent when the vote was called. Resolution 3151B. Israel, obviously and apparently absent. Resolution 3151C. Israel, again, obviously and apparently absent. Resolution 3151D, Israel finally present, but abstaining from the vote. Resolution 3151E, Israel again present, but abstaining from the vote. Resolution 3151F, Israel again, obviously and apparently absent. Resolution 32, 20, 3324A, 3324A, no vote taken. Israel, whew. Resolution 3324B, Israel absent. Resolution 3324C, Israel absent. Resolution 3324D, Israel abstaining. Resolution 3324E, Israel finally votes with South Africa. Resolution 3411A, no vote taken. Resolution 3411B, no vote taken. Resolution 3411C, Israel absent. Resolution 3411D, Israel absent. Resolution 3411E, no vote taken. Resolution 3411F, Israel abstaining. Resolution 3411G, Israel again votes, but votes on the side of South Africa. Whenever Israel is voting, Israel normally votes for the apartheid, racist, white supremacist posture and policy of the South African government. When Israel, the so-called white Jew, does not vote in the United Nations, it's because they're absent, they are, they are obviously, deliberately, did not show because they didn't want to go on record at all as Cabot cast a yea or a nay vote. Israel has an unholy alliance with South Africa. Here, you've got close to five million black people being ruled by a few thousand white folks in South Africa. And Israel keeps backing them up and keeps buoying them up and keeps supporting them. You can't tell me, brothers and sisters, that there would be any Jewish student in their right mind on this campus who would be your friend if you were a part of an African nation that was supporting Adolf Hitler and Hitler was still alive in Nazi Germany. Not one Jewish so-called white student on this campus would associate with you, would even be your friend if you defended an African nation that was supporting Hitler in Nazi Germany. Am I lying? But you are friends with them. And they support Israel. And Israel, I mean in Israel, they support Israel, and Israel supports South Africa. And you are their friends, and they expect you to be their friends, because they know that for the most part we are not critical thinkers, and they know for the most part we don't have a principal stand. We go by somebody's cute. I heard about the brothers around here in King College. How you leaving the sisters and buck dancing with these white girls. You running with Heather. I heard about it. I heard how you're wearing your ex cap and your ex sweatshirt and your ex t shirt. But you don't want to come to Minister Kadir. You don't want to come to the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, the ex who can explain, who, are the, who can set the example for you. You want to wear your ex externally, but you don't want to wear your ex internally. 
You just saw the X and got X excited. <laughs> you want to wear your X t-shirt, sweatshirt, and your X caps and X hats with a white girl on your elbow. Well, we got some X lax, which is the quickest relief for your jungle fever. And we're going to get it all out of your system before then. It was the Jews, the so-called Jews, that financed Spike Lee and gave him $30 million to produce the movie Malcolm X. Jesus was betrayed by Judas. Judas was given 30 pieces of silver. Spike Lee was given $30 million. No white Jew in his right mind would give a black man $30 billion to produce a movie that's going to present Islam in a positive light and convert the masses of black people to Islam. No white Jew in their right mind would give $30 million to Spook Lee to produce a movie that will spotlight a freedom fighter and a revolutionary in its proper and positive historical light. Malcolm X, El Hajj, Malik El Shabazz, Brother Omar Wadi. In that movie they made the honorable, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad seem like he was an, an unwise man. Like he was a fool. And Malcolm was self-taught. Malcolm was wise. It gave you the impression that we killed Malcolm X, the nation of Islam. Then Spook Lee went on TV. Spook Lee went on interviews everywhere. And Spook Lee said the nation of Islam killed Malcolm X. In his book, X, by any means necessary, I've got it in my black bag there. Spook Lee said, you know Spook Lee. Bubble-eyed pigeon told Jimmy the cricket <laughs> looking Spook Lee. Why am I so hard on Spook Lee? Because Spook Lee is trying to turn you away from your salvation. He wants you to believe that Elijah Muhammad and even infers that Louis Farrakhan had something to do with the murder of Malcolm X. Another no-good bastard. Spook Lee, illegitimate child of the father went on all these talk shows, straight up saying the black Muslims killed Malcolm X. He said that the two Muslims who went to prison, they didn't kill Malcolm. Other Muslims killed him. And they were working with the government. How silly is that spook? <laughs> Looking like he's been run over by a mule. <laughs> the mule chased him over 40 acres. <laughs> I've raised enough points here tonight for you to take. I've got so much stuff I could never get to all of it. The Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey had a strong position on the Jews also. Mr. Garvey said, Mr. Garvey said, that he says that their particular method of living is inconsistent with the broader human principles that go to making all people homogeneous. He said they like money, the Jews like money, and they have always been after money. They want nothing else but money. This is what Mr. Garvey said about it. It was the Jews, brothers and sisters, the so-called Jews, not only who crucified Jesus in a kangaroo court, but it was the Jewish prosecutor Maddox who prosecuted the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey in a kangaroo court. Jews in the judicial system that worked against Mr. Garvey and ultimately worked toward Mr. Garvey being deported from America. The so-called Jews. The hook nose, bagel eating, lox eating, imposter perpetrating a fraud, Johnny come lately, just crawled out of the caves and hills of Europe, wanna be Jew. Not the true Jew. For you are the true Jew. You are the true Hebrew. 
You are the true ones who are in line with Bible prophecy and scripture. So teaches the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan. You are the people of the Bible that fulfill the Bible prophecy. Genesis the 15th chapter, the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th verses. And God said unto Abram, Know of a surety, Abram, that thy seed shall be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and they shall serve them, and they shall oppress them, and they shall afflict them for four hundred years. And God said, Know that at the end of that four hundred years, that I am going to judge that nation that would have oppressed my people and enslaved my people, and I will judge that nation, and I will bring my people out with great riches and great substance, and they will go to a promised land. Don't let the imposter Jew tell you that Israel or Palestine is their Zion or their homeland. 1902, they went to Chamberlain and begged Chamberlain to give them Cyprus, and he didn't give them Cyprus. Then they talked about Uganda. They talked about some nation in South America. They've been all over the world talking about, well, gee whiz, why don't we take this for our homeland? <laughs> if God promised you a homeland, hell, you don't have to run all over the earth looking for a homeland. If God promises to you that his promise and his word is good, then you ain't got to take nothing from nobody when God promises you. They say they're the chosen people of God and that Israel, so-called Israel, is the promised land. Herzl, Ben-Gurion, and what's this other devil's name? White. They are the Messiah. The Bible said that you were supposed to wait for the Messiah. You didn't wait for the Messiah. Ben-Gurion wasn't the Messiah. Herzl wasn't the Messiah. The early so-called imposter Jews, they didn't even believe in God. They were atheists. Right, right. They didn't believe in no Bible prophets. And now you've set up Palestine, taking it from the Palestinian people. And the guilty white folks of the world met together and gave you that land. And you now lie to the world that you're the chosen people and that you are fulfilling Bible prophecy. No good bastard. <laughs> so I wanted to let you know, brothers and sisters, that you are the only people in the world that have been in bondage in a strange land among a strange people like Genesis, the 15th chapter 6, with God's covenant to Abraham. You're the only people that have been in bondage for 400 years anywhere, oppressed and afflicted. You are the chosen of God. And God has chosen you to be his people and he to be your God. And he has raised up in your midst a divine messenger, a divine messiah, and a divine warner. And the extension of that divine work is operating in your midst today in the person of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Take it or let it alone. That is where we are today. I thank you for listening. Assalamu alaikum. For your decision, for me. How many of you understood what you heard? Have a seat for a second. We'll run out. Just let me see your hands. How many of you understood? That's all I want to know. Hold your hands up if you understood. Let me see your hands if you understood. Hands down. How many of you believe what you heard is the truth and good for black people? Stand. You believe the truth and good for black people? Stand. Have a seat. It's hard to stand when you come with Heather. <laughs> Heather is hard as hell to stand. All night long, Heather is going to ask you, how could you stand? How could you leave me sitting there by myself? You believe all of those things he said? Oh, baby. Oh, baby, you know what I mean, you know. It's all right. Look. Anybody have questions? I tried to do this in a 
Let me see your hand. Questions? Anybody have questions? Come to the mic. If you're in this lecture, come to this mic. We will only take questions from those who come to the mic. Anybody that has questions, you must come to the mic. Slum Lake, my brother. Just a second. Well, it's slum. Any questions from over here? Come on. We only have one question. If you're not at the mic, we will not take your question. If you have a question, please come to the mic. Is that it? Come on. <laughs> No white folks? Or if you have a comment, come and make that too. If you have a comment, you can come and make that. If you have a statement, it's brief, you can come and make that. Is that it? Bob? Bell? Larry? Cindy? Ellie? Is that it? You and guys, I thought you got a quick question. Let me say this. The battle is for the minds and hearts of our people. And I fight hard. As I said, I take no risk. Whites who are in the audience, I don't care if you're uncomfortable. You should be uncomfortable. I didn't come, we're not armed. I didn't come to shoot from the hip. I came to shoot from the lip. I came to deal with truth. My brother's first. Uh. I know you've been in contact with the liberation movements in South Africa. Yes, sir. There's disagreement as to what the economic franchise should be in a, in a so-called post-apartheid South Africa. I was wondering what economic franchise you would propose to address the racial injustices in my country. You mean capitalism versus communism? Capitalism, socialism, socialism. mixed economy, Marxist land. Yes. My I second can, question is... Well, let's take it one at a time. I can't discuss the economic system with you first until we discuss the proper revolutionary approach. I do not agree with Brother Nelson Mandela and the ANC. Let me say that straight up. I spoke at the United Nations. I was there. Uh, all right. I spoke at the United Nations for the PAC on the celebration of the uh, Annual Convention of the actual honoring of Brother Robert, uh, Mongolisa Robert Sabukwe of the, uh, one of the founding fathers of the Pan-Africanist Congress. It was in 58, 59 that the young leaders of the ANC, the young lions in the ANC, decided in 58, 59, because it was in 1960, that Chief Ladouli, the head of the ANC, received the Nobel Peace Prize for nonviolent struggle, just like Mandela just received it with F.W. de Klerk. How could you stand with your oppressor and your enemy and receive the Nobel Peace Prize for nonviolent struggle? I was reading in Jet Magazine recently where Sister Winnie Mandela, who's my revolutionary, Manda. where Sister Winnie Mandela, Manda, Sister Winnie Mandela said it was an insult for Nelson Mandela to stand with F.W. de Klerk and received the Nobel Peace Prize. But the point I was making from history, I'm right with you, brother. 1960, Chief Ladouli received the Nobel Peace Prize for nonviolent struggle. But at the same time, the Chief Ladouli was receiving the Nobel Peace Prize. The young lions, the young warriors inside of the ANC, Robert Sabukwe inspired, rose up, and he became a has-been leader the same day he was receiving the Nobel Peace Prize. They split with the ANC, started the PAC, and then later the ANC tried to get a little radical and added the wing to the ANC called them Kota And the Kota way was to start self-defense and violence for violence. Let me be clear with you, brothers and sisters. I don't believe in Nelson Mandela's approach. I don't believe in the Codessa Accord. I don't agree with meeting with the white man in South Africa on this issue. One man, one vote. One person, one vote. A multiracial government in South Africa. We don't owe the white man nothing in South Africa. He's killed millions of our women, our children, our babies, our elders. We don't owe him nothing in South Africa. If we want to be merciful at all, when we gain enough power from God Almighty to take our freedom and independence 
from him, we give him 24 hours to get out of town by Sunday. That's all. If he won't get out of town by sundown, we kill everything white that ain't right that's in sight in South Africa. We kill the women. We kill the children. We kill the baby. We kill the blind. We kill the cripple. We kill the oh, 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 oh. We kill them all. We kill the tiger. We kill the lesbian. We kill them all. You say, why kill the babies in South Africa? Because they're going to grow up one day to oppress our babies. So we kill the baby. Why kill the women? They, they, because they lay on their back. They are the military or the army manufacturing center. They lay on their back and the reinforcements roll out from between their legs. So we kill the women too. You're going to kill the elders too? Kill the old ones too. God damn it, if they're in a wheelchair, push them off a cliff and take them. Push them off a cliff and take them. Or your hunter's bird. Or he seeks them away. Or Port Shepston or Durban. The hell you think they got old? They got old oppressing black people. I said, kill the blind. Kill the cripple. Kill the crazy. Damn it, and when you get through killing them all, go to the goddamn graveyard and dig up the grave and kill them a goddamn Because they didn't die hard. They didn't die hard. Kill them all and you don't have the strength to dig them up? Then take your gun and shoot in the goddamn grave. Kill them again. Kill them again. Because they didn't die hard enough. I cannot focus on an economic system in South Africa until we get our politics right. Until we determine what the revolutionary approach is going to be. What a fool you are. Mandela, somebody bum rush your house. Black boots stomp your door down. They come in, rape everybody in the house, men and the women. Take everything. On their way out of the door, they got their gun on you. are able to take their gun and put their gun on them. Does that make you a reverse robber and a reverse rapist? No. You're defending yourself. Don't come with this reverse discrimination, reverse racism. We've never done anything to the white man. We have robbed you of your name, your language, your religion, your culture, your gun. Yes, I'm the voice that you give a public enemy. Have you forgotten? That when we were brought here, we were robbed of our name, right. robbed of our language. We lost our religion, our culture, our God. And many of us, by the way we act, we even oh, lost our mind. mind. That is our condition as a people. The voice that you hear is for the ice cube. Let me live my life. When I can no longer live my life, then let me give my life for the liberation and salvation of the black nation. Saints, saviors, soldiers, scholars, healers and killers. No longer dead, deaf, dumb and blind out of our mind in the white man's mind. No more homicide, no more suicide, no more fratricide, genocide and menticide. Look to goddamn white man in his cold blue eyes and say, uh uh devil, don't even try it, cause we baby kids, we don't die, we multiply, we don't die, we multiply. So brothers and sisters, let's get the politics right first, before we get the money. Don't you know that this is the same devil who's tried to get out from under the economic sanctions that have been posed, the economic sanctions that has been posed against him by the rest of the world. He's only trying to create an image. He's taking notes from the white man in America. When Jim Crow was ultimately changed in appearance in America, they just gave Jim Crow another name. And so when they change apartheid in South Africa, it will only have another name. What is your second question? How many disagree with you? How many agree with you? Let me see it. Teach your baby. 
teach your babies, don't teach your babies about Christmas Adams. Christmas Adams was the first one to die in the American Revolution. Hell, he should have died. Fight for the white folks. And our people were free. Teach your babies about Nat Turner. Teach your babies about Denmark B. Teach your babies about Gabriel Prophet. Teach your babies about Tucson Overture. Teach your babies about Gasoline the Ferocious. Teach your babies about Queen Nzinga. Teach your babies about Queen Yahasantiwa. Teach your babies about Queen Candace. Teach your babies about Amilcar Gabra, Patrice Lumumba, Osajifo and Kuma. Teach your babies about those who have fought for us. Not those who laid down Morgan Freeman and driving Miss Daisy. <laughs> he just came back from Africa. It was in all of the Washington, D.C. newspapers. Morgan Freeman came back from Africa and said that he didn't even like Africa. He said that he's mongrelized. He's not African. He's not black. He said, don't bring me that mess about black people were dragged from Africa on slave ships in chains. He said, black people left Africa running trying to get to America. Morgan Freeman. Driving Miss Daisy when he ain't driving or he's riding. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, my second question is, since I've been here, two black banks have closed down, one in Harlem and one in Newark. You're an economic major. Finance. Yeah. Finance man. All right. Give him a black hand. Huh? Most of people still save their money in white banks, and you know who controls those banks? It's Jews. The thing is, they given control the Federal Reserve. Yeah, at all. they control the Federal Reserve. What, my, what my question is: What could we as businessmen do to prevent this? And women. And women. And women. Yeah. Thank you. Sister. And women. What could we do to prevent? What we do it this way? What could we do as business women and men? Business women and men. What could we do to prevent? Our banks from closing down, and what what could we do to encourage the creation of capital pools within our own financial institutions? Institutions. Maybe I need to read that. This book, yeah, this book. <laughs> the Honorable Louis Farrakhan deals with the finance system and the economic fiber of America, and to some degree, it touches on the world. And I think it would be a good a contribution to me. Well, this one is already marked up, and I got all my okay. all my war points in here. But do you have any, Brother Sundiata and yes, Sister Chandler? And uh, yes, there's 25 here, and March 25 has a, a, a book display of liberation literature also set up outside. So I mean, make sure, Brother, and you should meet our minister. You're a finance man with a finance major. You need to go and sit with our minister there in New. You know, when we gain this knowledge, we gotta use this knowledge for the benefit of the rise of our people. How can we keep our black banks from closing? Yes, yeah, how do we create capital pools within our own nation? How do we create capital pools within our own nation? The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan has started the three-year economic savings plan. I know that Dr. John Henry Clark attacked him. Verbally, I love Dr. Clark. He attacked him and said, Minister Farrakhan never finishes a program. He starts things and don't finish it. Shut up. <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about. And you can't see what we're doing. The Honorable Louis Farrakhan started the three-year economic savings plan. In three years, the plan launched. But our people are slow. And if at the end of three years he did not have the capital that we desire to do certain projects, then what should he do? Give all the money back or extend it? Well, he not only is extending it, but he is also, for Dr. Clark's advice, I mean, uh, uh, for Dr. Uh, Clark's uh, information, we advise you from now on to wait a minute great and venerable elder and scholar and historian, wait, did you know, brothers and sisters, that we have now paid cash a million plus dollars for our own multi-million dollar 
computerized printing operation so that we can now print our own books, print the final call newspaper. Did you know Ebony and Jeff, that they don't print their own magazines after all these years? The white man still printing? Or if not the white man, you know, still print? We can now negotiate with other black publications that don't have the capacity to print their own. We're paying cash for it. Where's the money coming from, Dr. Clark? It's coming out of the three-year economic savings plan. Did you know that we have now purchased the sales and office building from Cottage Grove, a high-rise on Cottage Grove in Chicago? Did you know we have now bought what used to be the is a big uh, market and a big office building on Halstead. Did you know that we are now beginning to negotiate and make plans for buying farmland, dairy, cannery, and we will be within, within a year's time setting up a shopping mall, uh, a shopping plaza, a shopping plaza, what they call a strip mall, in Chicago, where's the money coming from? Part of it from the three-year economic savings plan and the rest from a major economic thrust among the, the believers in the nation of Islam and to our, and our brothers and sisters who are members of the nation of Islam but who have not yet joined yet. You. Did you also know that in addition to this we will have our own, our own fleet? Black people, we'll have our own fleet of diesel trucks rumbling the highways again during interstate trade and commerce? Did you know that we will open up eventually our own black bank again, the way we used to have on Stony Island? All of these are plans coming up out of the three-year economic savings plan. We need a communication system. We need radio. We need television. We need to set up the a capacity, and we're working toward that so that the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan can sit in not our White House, but our Black House, the palace in Chicago, and actually talk to the world on satellite right from Woodlawn in Chicago. All of this is coming out. So we can, we're developing that kind of example. Normally black people fall out over months, but in the nation of Islam, a capital pool that kind of economic base, we are pooling our nickels and dimes. We are pooling our dollars. And the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, in the tradition of his spiritual father, the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad, is proving to us that a dollar with Elijah or a dollar with Farrakhan, you don't have to worry about anybody stealing the money. You give Elijah or Farrakhan a dollar, they give you farmland back, they give you banks back. They give us trucks back. We're now negotiating. We're talking about we need cargo planes again. We need passenger planes again. And we are now going to begin to lay the base for all of that. In addition to that, brother, we found that many of the black banks, they're all connected, as you know, to the big bank downtown. Many of the black banks are only glorified check cashing places. When you get to transactions up to a certain amount of money, the bank can't even handle it. They'll have to delay you for a week or so until they handle the transaction with the big white bank downtown. We found out that the Federal Reserve ain't really owned by the federal government. Well, the cracker is a cracker is a cracker. Anyway, but it ain't owned by the federal government. The Federal Reserve is owned by, you just touched on it a little while ago. It's owned by the Jews. You go back to the Rothschilds, and you go back to a lot of the early Jews that are in that financial system. So, brother, technically, we're going to have to pull together as a people and begin to pool our knowledge, our wisdom, and pool our resources, mentally, morally, spiritually, and financially, in order to ultimately, as God brings us up out of this condition and this position and this situation, we're going to have to seek a nation of our own and freedom and independence. And if everybody else could do it and nobody criticizes them, then you shut your mouth when the black man and woman stand up to build a nation of our own and develop our own education, economic, 